Tonight, a real life scandal. It's handled. Uh, not exactly. An affair. Are you humiliated by this? And the boss who tried to cover it up. He said, Ben, I need you to destroy me. Can you come to my office? A late night in Michigan. A mysterious phone call. Todd, what do you mean? I was scared. What's going on? You're freaking me out. Inside, just one man, the face of Christian family values, Representative Todd Corser. Friends, it's time for some straight talk. This statesman has a secret to bury, a steamy affair with her, a married colleague. My name is Cindy Gamrad. I'm running for state representative. His outlandish plan, laid out on a hidden recording, is to smear himself. Of course, they're caught on tape behind Lansing Nightclub. Born addicted to sexual deviant, male on male, paid for sex. So when people find out that it came from you, they're going to ask, Todd, what the hell are you thinking? Making up something so outrageous. <laughs> what? No one would believe it when the truth about his love life leaked out. Are you a hypocrite? We're right there with them as they speak to 2020 about the outrageous national scandal. Sex, lies, cover-ups. Cheating on their spouses. A lead story. A bizarre attempt to hide their extramarital affair. And a laughing stock. That is the worst plan I've ever heard. And I'm including trickle-down economics, the pull-out method, and the plot of the parent trap. It's not about me. Tonight, blackmail. People were following you guys. It's as if they knew your every move. They did know every move. Threatening texts. Oh, my God. A secret affair. Wow. All leading to disorder in the house. You have power, politics, sex. That's not how I wanted it to go. The circus needs to go. A capital offense. Good evening. I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And if you're stuck in a snowstorm tonight, settle in for tonight's mystery with plot twists you will not believe. The number one being, why would a politician fabricate an outrageous scandal to discredit himself? A scandal to cover up his real life secret. It all began a full year ago this month, but tonight the puzzle pieces finally coming together right here. Those recordings, the threats, and now the two at the center of the affair speaking out to 2020 about why there was such an attempt to cover it up. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez with a capital offense. Lansing, Michigan, its modest skyline nestled around the noble dome of the capital is normally the humdrum hub of state government. Typical Midwest town with typical Midwest politics. You solemnly swear to uphold... But that all changed last January when two ambitious newcomers come to town. Freshman representative Cindy Gamrat... I ran for office because I believe in freedom. ...and Todd Corser. We were going there on a mission. The two buttoned-down, plain-spoken poles hail from opposite sides of the state. So you got, what, 30 acres here? There's 30, yeah. It's great for the children, obviously. It sort of created a, you know, Huck Finn life. Corser, a lawyer by trade, is from rural, religious Lapeer in the east. I think it's 112 churches in the, in the county. It's a very faith-based community. And Gamrat, a homemaker and former nurse from the modestly titled town of Plainwell in the west. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful place to, to live. Their districts may be far apart, but their politics can't be any closer. Both staunch Tea Party Christian values conservatives and both married parents, firm believers in faith and family. Interesting considering what's about to happen. He seemed to share the same values and the same principles as I had. What was part of your message? Christian and family values? Yeah. Send me to Lansing to be a strong voice for liberty and our conservative values. Mixed in with, again, the government overreach. I believe our federal government is out of control. She's very high energy, not scared of anybody, and just very principled. Enter two key players, Keith Allard, who signs on as Gamrat's number two, and Ben Graham, an old friend who becomes Courser's top aide. He's a, a very dynamic person. Uh, he's very engaging. He's very charismatic. He definitely draws you in, and he knows that. I'm against this. Thank you. Last January, the two first-termers hit Lansing like a cannonball, determined to push their ultra-conservative agenda, even if it means fighting their own party. Come hell or high water, we weren't going to cut a deal with the GOP to, to sort of further ourselves politically. 
but the disruptive duo's sharp elbows approach alienate just about any potential ally they'd need to get their bills passed. Todd actually kind of declared public warfare on his colleagues. They were just very suspicious that everybody was looking to stab them in the back. In fact, the only relationship Courser and Gamrat seem to be cultivating is their own. The two are certainly close. I also think we're missing a component They go on here TV to together and even combine their two staffs, running operations out of the same office. Very unusual. So, I mean, as soon as they uh, got here, people were talking. There are also frequent late night sessions that have the two overnighting at the downtown Radisson Hotel. We actually would have lobbyists and fellow staff members ask us if they're having a relationship. But we also just couldn't believe that these two would do something like that. It's doing great. Yes, it is hard to believe. Todd Courser is married to his college sweetheart, Fawn. They have four kids together, pick apples in their spare time. That's a good one, buddy. And Cindy Gamrat is raising three kids of her own with her longtime husband, Joe, the kind of house mom you see smiling out of Facebook photos and price hunting in the produce aisle. Definitely, you don't forget the Oreos. <laughs> But the rumor mill keeps churning, and now somebody in this quiet capital is doing more than talking. It looks like they're stalking. Take a look at this. It's an uncredited photo of Courser giving Gamrat a foot rub in broad daylight while parked at a Lansing strip mall. The photo is posted online after a nameless paparazzo delivers it to controversial political blogger Brandon Hall. It was just like, wow. You know, I mean, what is my representative doing right now in Lansing? You know, they probably think they're in their office or, you know, voting. And here they are in a parking lot giving each other foot rubs. People were following you guys and yeah. taking these pictures of you I know. together in this car. And there's nothing happening in the car. Okay, maybe not in the car, but there is quite a bit happening elsewhere, specifically that Radisson. It turns out that Courser and Gamrat really are more than political bedfellows. It's your typical secret double life. They're putting themselves out there as these right-wing Christians, but they're fornicating behind the scenes. Given your positions on family values, didn't you see it as a real risk that this affair was going to be going on? In the beginning, it doesn't happen that way. As you walk forward and then all of a sudden, before you know it, you're in a relationship with somebody. Despite the happy photos, Courser does acknowledge that his marriage to Fawn was as cold and dead as an Upper Peninsula winner. It was a burden, a tremendous burden. Was there any moment uh, where you just thought to yourself, Todd, what the hell are you thinking? Well, I mean, there was a bitterness and a hardness of heart. And at that point, you don't even recognize yourself. Are you a hypocrite? You know, it's tough because I think there is a, a component of that. Well, everybody would hear that I'm a believer in Christ. They wouldn't hear the part that I'm failed and flawed, you know, like everybody else, but it was true. And what's Representative Gamrat's position on this issue? Can you tell us what was going through your mind at the time? No, I'm, I'm just not going not gonna to get into that. Did you violate traditional family values? Sure. Yeah, I did. I, I violated the covenant um, between a husband and a wife. The affair continues throughout the spring. So do the rumors, and so do the denials. One of our staff said to them, you need to consider the optics of the situation. And they laughed it off. They just said it was a joke to them. But it's no laughing matter when the whiff of blackmail starts swirling around the couple. Out of the blue, both Gamrat and Courser start receiving a series of text messages threatening to expose their affair from an anonymous, disposable burner phone. Just look at some that Courser saved. Cindy sounds like she's great in the sheets. Silence in this case can be very detrimental. It could be disastrous, really. The texter says he'll let everybody off the hook on one condition only. You resign, Todd. He made the same demand of Gamrat, and adding teeth to the threat, the texter is referencing their private phone calls and inside details of their trips. It's as if they knew your every move. They did know every move. They knew my emails out of my outbox even after I changed my password. They knew texts from my phone. The texter is someone close, someone with the means and the will to destroy him. It's enough to put anyone on edge. There was just a, a lot of stress. Obviously, this was driving you to a breaking point. 
I would say that you couldn't have been at a lower spot. Todd is usually very chipper and, and sarcastic and fun, but there would be times where he would take things out on us with a great deal of anger. It was tough. Uh, it, was, it was very tough. And it's about to get a lot tougher as Representative Corser concocts a truly twisted plan to make his problems go away. He said, Ben, I need you to destroy me. And I, I paused for a second and I, I said, Todd, what do you mean? Stay with us. It is May in Michigan, and embattled state representative Todd Corser is alone in his law office in the small town of Lapeer, terrified that a mystery texter is on the verge of exposing his affair with colleague Cindy Gamrat. Now he makes the fateful decision to pick up the phone and call his right-hand man, Ben Graham. In the most serious tone I've ever heard from him, he said, I need you to destroy me. Can you come to my office? destroy me? Fearing not only for his job, but for his safety, Graham immediately notifies his counterpart on Cindy Gamrat's staff, Keith Allard. This is a guy who has been showing increasingly unstable signs in terms of his anger issues. There's a 20% chance he might act out violently toward himself or others, and he kept a loaded gun in that office. So I advise Ben, record the conversation. What's going on? You're freaking me out. So with his all-hearing phone recording everything, Graham sits down across from Corser's desk and gets the shock of a lifetime. It turns out Corser wants Graham to send an anonymous email to fellow Republicans, and it ain't about tax reform. It's already written. I didn't print it. I don't know what God will do, buddy. I've got Corser caught on tape behind Lansing Nightclub. Truth, Corser secretly removed from caucus several weeks ago due to a mail on mail paid for sex. He is a bisexual, porn addicted, sexual deviant. Your ears aren't deceiving you. Corser has concocted an email to shovel dirt on himself for scandalous behavior. And check out the potty mouth on this devout Christian. And you just get nasty about it. <laughs> is hanging out all over Lansing since the election. Gun toting, Bible thump, <laughs> freak. He doesn't work in Lansing. He's just there feeding his habit of alcohol, drugs, and illicit sex. What he was telling me literally blew me away. I did not expect that that would happen that he would say those things. And it just gets crazier because Corser insists that none of these scandalous claims are true. In fact, they're absurd, but that's the whole point. I'm not a homosexual. I don't do alcohol, I don't do drugs, right? That's what I mean, that's why it's not believable. Right, but they don't know that. People are so disturbed, they won't print it. But anything after that is gonna be suspect. It'll be looking, looking like a complete smear campaign. Anything after that? Corser is clearly anticipating that the mystery texter will be exposing his love affair with Cindy Gamrat any day now. Stuff's gonna come out, Benjamin, and they're gonna implicate myself and Cindy Gamrat. Corser's hope is that the phony smear will somehow thwart the extortion scheme of the mysterious texter by diverting attention from the affair. I'm gonna start a rumor that I'm having sex with gay prostitutes all over Lansing, and that's just gonna make the uh, uh, affair with, uh, you know, affair with Cindy seem like nothing, and nothing's gonna stick to the wall because it's so slimy. People will see it and they'll be like, holy <laughs> what is that? You know, I even hear my voice, I don't even recognize who I am. So when people find out that it came from you and it's about you, they're gonna ask, are you crazy? Yeah, it's a, it, inside of that, at, the, at that moment, at that situation in the darkness of where I was at, just personally. Why did you decide to go with the storyline of a gay prostitute? I mean, did it was you so, think... It was so ridiculous. Um, it, it was really over the top, and it was offensive to, to, you know, to homosexuals. It was completely ridiculous, and I didn't mean it. Let's listen to some of that audio. But what about Gamrat's role in the scheme? On the recording, Corser says she's down with the plan. Hey, we agreed. Who? Cindy and I. On this? Yeah. So, right there, he says that you both agreed on this. Mm hmm Yeah. Is he lying? Well, when I heard that audio, what ran through my mind is, why did he say that? So this email for you came out of left field? Yes. So that was He's, a lie? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Back in that law office, Corser's demented plan has little appeal for his aide, Ben Graham. Remember, Corser wants Graham to send the email for him. Instead, the trusted aide says he walks out of the meeting shaken and alarmed. I couldn't believe he was asking me, uh, and I 
I, I couldn't do it. I texted him back and said, Todd, I can't help you do this. I can't help you cover it up. I think loyalty went out the window for these staffers and crazy filled the room. Undeterred, Courser sends out the self-incriminating email himself under a fake name to a Republican mailing list. Breaking scandal, blared the subject line. Indeed, it feels like this scandal has crossed into Olivia Pope's turf. Hand in your resignation, because in this town, your career is over. And yet, despite hitting the self-destruct button, Courser does not self-destruct. The email gets little notice. The sleaze bomb is a dud. I sort of dismissed it because I thought, well, I, I hear a lot of weird stuff in politics and slanderous things are said about a lot of people. Better still, the tormenting texture never follows through with the threats. Did you think, I'm going to get away with this? Well, I don't think it was really to get away with it. It's like one of those chapters in your life you say, you know, it was a... You know, it was a crazy time. But then, Courser and Gamrat give themselves more bad advice and follow it. That summer, for reasons now in litigation, they decide to cut off their own right hands. Ben Graham and Keith Allard, citing poor performance. They'd come into work late. They wouldn't show up on. They were required to. These are the guys who know all of your secrets. They do. Was it the smart idea to fire them? There's no way that they were, they were competent that they should be there. Maybe so, but hell hath no fury like a staffer score. I felt that it was important for people to know the truth about these people and what they were doing. And we begin in Michigan. Todd Courser. Coming up, those confidants double-cross the boss, and Todd Courser finally hits the national political stage, but not in the way he hoped. It's true. <laughs> He sent an anonymous email accusing himself of a fake liaison with a male prostitute. My very first reaction was, oh my God, this is huge. How will the betrayed spouses take the news? What was going through your mind when he first told you? And the fight for their political lives. What will their punishment be for their capital offense? It's a pleasant summer day at the Detroit News Bureau in Lansing, Michigan. Suddenly, reporter Chad Livengood receives a call that makes his year. I got a phone call from a source who indicated that Ben Graham and Keith Allard would like to meet with me. Yeah. Graham and Allard have been fired by their bosses, controversial state representatives Todd Courser and Cindy Gamrat. Now it's time for some payback with the playback. I felt it was important for their families and their spouses to know and for it to come out and so they could deal with it. I sat down with these two men and they started to play this tape for me. Todd Courser caught on tape behind Lansing Nightclub. He is a bisexual, porn addicted, sexual deviant. Yep, that recording. It'll be looking, looking like a complete smear campaign. It was shocking. It was unbelievable. I could instantly see how this was going to be a powerful story to tell. On August 7th, Live and Good Story detonates on the front page, setting off a media frenzy. The bizarre situation. A sex and cover-up scandal. It's an elaborate scheme. For reporter Jim Kirchner of ABC Detroit affiliate WXYZ, the story is prime red meat as course of supporters go into bunker mode. You're a reporter out for his blood. No one in Michigan has seen anything like this in the last three decades. The state house sex scandal cover up. Cover up the adultery with lies. Juicy element after juicy element after juicy element. All of the sordid details. We've been up here every day this week. I spent days and days on the outside of his little law office. And you're going to take some accountability questions, sir. But he didn't have anything to say. Why are you hiding? For weeks you're three dodging weeks. reporters. At least three weeks. Doesn't look good. No, it wouldn't look good. It was a difficult situation, obviously, because they were trying to track us down. Through it all, Mrs. Courser stands by her man. What was going through your mind when he first told you what was going on? I, I was pretty calm when he first told me. Um, now it was subsequent days after that. I didn't handle it so well, but, you know, we're, we're working it out. You can't really point finger at somebody when they do something and when they fall, because we all fall. We all make mistakes. Meanwhile, 150 miles away in Plainwell, there's nothing plain or well at the Gamret residence. 
So Cindy, what was that next morning like when the news broke? We had scheduled for that day to go to the zoo. And of course, the media came. They were outside. We said, OK, let's, you know, let's like make a beeline for the for the truck. Eventually, the scandal Todd Corser goes national. He intentionally leaked a fake news story about himself hiring a male prostitute. What? And it's irresistible to TV comments. Uh, well, I wasn't having an affair. I was actually hiring a male prostitute. <laughs> that is the worst plan I've ever heard. And I'm including trickle-down economics, the pull-out method, and the plot of the parent trap. Todd Corser always wanted to hit the big time, but not like that. Here you are on national TV, those comedy talk shows, you're the butt of jokes. Yeah. What's that like? I'm pretty tough, meaning um, I don't, my blood pressure doesn't go up a whole lot. But this was tough. One week later, I just want to thank my family. Gamrat takes her place in the pantheon of cheating politicians who issue public apologies with stoic spouses by their side. My husband is here, Joe, and I have three, three children. Joe Gamrat looks on, his face bereft of the family photo smile. What about your husband? Has he since forgiven you? He says he has, and I believe he has. I'm not here to resign today. I'm just here to say I'm sorry. How many people here feel that Cindy Gamrat should resign at this point in time? But sometimes sorry doesn't cut it. They need to resign immediately. Tad, you need to give it up. You need to come out now and, and say it's over. Just step down. With all the, the Christian values that are here, it must have rocked this community. It did. I mean, it, it really rocked our, our small town. Did they start saying you're not a real Christian? Yeah, oh, absolutely. A lot of times the most unforgiving people are people who profess Christ. So and you, I bet you've taken some hard questions from them. You know, some people really relish watching somebody burn. Just love it. And it's, it's sick and it's evil and it's demonic. And remember, Gamrat and Corser already have plenty of enemies within their own party. Now the political knives are out. Their scandal was dragging everybody down. They were embarrassing the leaders. They were embarrassing the party. The House launches an investigation which finds numerous instances of deceptive, deceitful, and outright dishonest conduct by both representatives and says they abuse their offices in attempting to cover it up. It's not always the, uh, the scandal, but it's the cover-up. Claims that to this day, both Corser and Gamrat strongly deny. No comment. Are you humiliated by this? They're recommending that you be expelled. Is that appropriate, sir? That sets the stage for a dark and dramatic night under the Capitol Dome last September. There's no death penalty in Michigan, but this sure felt like an execution. By then, the Republicans and the leaders and everybody had said, we got to toss out the trash. Stand against deception and disdain and disrespect. And While Representative lies. Ed McBroom and others and lobby for expulsion, Corser is not about to go gentle into that good night. I had no intention of resigning. I was, I'm a gladiator, I'm a warrior. Then I would ask that you folks would vote uh, no on expelling me. So but as the clock strikes 12, unfit to continue to serve, it becomes clear irreparable harm. The gladiator is being fed to the lion. Really shameful behavior. Very dramatic. I think it was about you know two o'clock in the morning. We could see that he was on the House floor lobbying colleagues, pleading to stay. They were not letting us leave until they got an expulsion out of me. Today is the day to end this. The circus needs to go. You know, I just felt like it was done, and I walked up and just said, hey, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm going to resign. Escorted by red-coated security guards, Corser makes his exit. Were you devastated? No. You know those lead blankets that they put on you at the dentist? It was like 20 of those came off me as I walked out the door. I got in my truck and drove away, and I got about, I think I got about five miles, and I just pulled into a, a parking lot, and I just turned the truck off, and uh, I didn't move for 12 hours. You've let down so many people and god if i could go back and undo it you know lord knows i would back in the house chamber it's four in the morning and it's cindy's turn to ascend the scaffold she says she too thought about simply throwing in the towel the other representative had resigned and i panicked a little bit 
But in that sea of hostility, Cindy finds a rock of support, her 18-year-old son, Joey. In my mind, resigning is kind of giving up the fight before you even get to actually fight. He said, stay and fight. He said, okay, mom, take a deep breath and uh, hold your head high. You're gonna walk in, you're gonna act like you own the place. You know, I can't go back. I can't go back and change the past. The only thing I could do was try to go forward and do it better. And I still believe that my actions warrant, ex warrant censure, but not expulsion. Gamrat pleads her case a final time, but the House has heard enough. There are 91 I votes and 12 nay votes. They vote 91 to 12 to expel her. She's escorted out with her head held high, making Michigan history as the first woman to be expelled from that chamber. I mean, this is everything you had worked for. I know. And here it is in one night, gone. This isn't how I pictured it. Even regardless of all this pressure. Sorry. That's not how I wanted it to go. Two Michigan lawmakers are out of office. Their political obituaries are written. A strange end to an even stranger scandal. It was the ultimate final curtain for both of them. But sometimes final curtains aren't so final. Get this. Just the latest twist. It's Gamrat and Courser, the sequel. Some were very surprised. They're not ready to give up the spotlight yet, and they want to shine it on whoever was sending those mystery texts that led to their downfall. Stay with us. They're sorry, they're ashamed, but Todd Corser and Cindy Gamrat are not about to let trifles like their tabloid sex scandal and expulsion from office dash their ambitions. Former Representative Todd Corser announcing he will run for re-election after giving up his seat just a week ago. Cindy Gamrat is formally announcing that she will run for her old seat. Yep, brazen as it may seem, Todd and Cindy have ended their affair, but now they want to continue their political careers. They were almost in denial. They didn't look at themselves the way everybody else in Michigan was looking at them. Why are you running again? One of the things that concerned me the most was that my voters didn't have a voice in the matter at all. Plenty of other candidates are vying for the seats too, but Gamrat and Courser have something the competition lacks. I have the highest name ID I think of anybody that's ever run for state house. I think what has happened is sort of um, elevated me to mythical status. But a lot of people will say, come on, name recognition, that's the reason you wouldn't be voted for. If you have time that passes, I uh, certainly have the best name recognition of anybody. But is um, it for the right reason? Well, it's negative now. But I said the people should have their opportunity to, to make their choice. But back in Lansing, their former colleagues aren't exactly eager to welcome them back. It was a continuation of the bizarre behavior. I think it showed contempt for the system. It showed their contempt for the voters. It'll be my name on the ballot. It's not about me. It's about the people. Courser and Gamrat say they are still the most conservative candidates running. Really now the, the voters will have an opportunity to be able to make their own decisions. This is no normal election. And now they just want to make laws, not love. Election day in West Michigan with several big seats. November 3rd, election day, judgment day, and 2020 is there. Lord, your, your ways are, are the right ways. A prayer is very much in order. No matter the outcome in all of this and, and what we do, um, it's in your hands. What's going through your mind today? Obviously, it's, uh, you know, it's a huge day and you get all the emotions of all of this happening. Corser of spends the day yeah, chatting up reporters and voters while Gamrat makes some last-minute calls to constituents. Hi, this is Cindy Gamrat. I was just calling to encourage you and remind you to get out and vote today. They're at the polls. They're almost done. Hello. Courser stays Hello. loose, toying with his dog, Coco. Well, let's go. You want the pizza or the ball? She hasn't decided that yet. But as the results trickle in. Well, despite being two of the most talked about state legislators in recent memory, Todd Courser and Cindy Gamrat will not be going back to Lansing. It's clear that the electorate's love affair with the two Tea Partiers is kaput. Cindy gets just 9% of the vote. And what was going through your mind as you're getting the results, sir? I was disappointed. It's been a hard road, and we worked really hard. We've given it our best. I'm exhausted. As for Courser, he gets a backwoods whooping, garnering less than 4%. Gary Howell actually won. There's mine, 299. 
and he ended up with 2,263. The bad news, he lost an election. The good news, his wife Fawn is still there, faithfully, with open arms. That's okay. It's politics. It'll take me a little while to kind of obviously heal from it and take some steps forward. Post-election, Corsa retreats back to his law office in Lapeer to lick his wounds. But there's some unfinished business fevering his brain. He just can't get over those mysterious text messages that hit his iPhone last May. Remember, a hidden extortionist threatened to reveal the affair unless he and Gamrat resigned. Harassment, which Corsa maintains, sent him over the edge. Do you believe at that point that you were being blackmailed? The texter was requiring me to resign. It felt like there was a bigger power at work here. Corsa won't stop until he gets some answers. And that investigation will bring this story to its unlikely conclusion at this unexpected location with an even more surprising suspect. Was Corser up to his old tricks again? You wrote that email. Yeah. Why wouldn't you yeah. send those texts? The twists and turns lead to the mystery texter. I remember reading the report and, and just shaking and, and not wanting to believe. When 2020 returns. For months, it's been one of the biggest mysteries in Michigan politics. Who was the shadowy figure who sent those blackmail texts to Todd Corser and Cindy Gamera, threatening to expose their affair unless they resigned? The guy who helped put the whole tragic farce in motion. There was this guessing game. Who was the sender of those texts? That became sort of the hottest guessing game in town. Remember, the mystery texter somehow knew private details of Todd and Cindy's phone calls, emails, and even their schedule. Not many people had the inside information of what was really going on. Leading Corsa to believe that the texter was someone close. You know, someone like a trusted aide, someone like Ben Graham or Keith Allard, possibly spilling secrets to his political enemy. I would say that somehow the texters are connected to the staff in some way to be able to get the information they had. I can 100% assure you right now that it was not us. For him to say that we were involved in blackmailing him is laughable because the texter asked him to resign. If he resigns, I lose my job. The texter had warned Courser that his phone was a burner, a disposable phone. So don't bother trying to trace it. Then a breakthrough when a private investigator hired by Cindy's attorney is able to trace the name on the phone's account. Get ready for this. It was a certain C. Livengood, the name of the Detroit news reporter who broke the story, Chad Livengood. <laughs> My initial reaction was, that's not surprising that somehow they're going to try to pin this on me, but that's not going to work uh, because I had nothing to do with it. And check out that spelling. Most print reporters know how to write their own name. Mine's with an E-N, and this said I-N-G-O-O-D. Then another startling twist. The blog MLive.com hires its own PI to look into the burner phone. And this time, a different name is uncovered. None other than Todd Corser. Corser had a crazy scheme in mind. A lot of people were wondering, are these texts real, or are these texts part of Corsair playing the victim again? You wrote that email. Yeah. Why wouldn't you yeah. send those texts? Obviously, my credibility is already shot. Corsair is so determined to clear his name and catch the real culprits, he walks into the state police headquarters in Lansing, demanding the cops launch a criminal investigation. Well, I was hoping that they would they would take it seriously and look through it. I mean, they didn't. Uh, the officer there, you know, said. Uh, we know you did it. You just need to confess and you shouldn't make false police reports. Eventually, the police do launch an investigation and are able to track GPS locations from the burner phone to the town of Port Huron, Michigan, specifically to here, the Domtar paper plant. Investigators make a shocking discovery. There's a traveling chemical salesman working at that plant, a person very close to Gamrat's family. Believe it or not, her own husband, Joe, I was devastated to see the police report. I remember reading the report and, and just shaking and, and not wanting to believe what I was reading. 
According to the report, an accomplice at the plant bought the phone with money provided by Joe Gamrat, and Gamrat would tell him what to text. Apparently, they were also assigning those misleading names to the account to throw off the scent. Gamrat has denied the allegations, and although he was named as a suspect, the prosecutor declined to press charges. Did you feel vindicated? Oh, sure. You felt like, see, I told you so, I wasn't the texter. Right, yeah, I mean, obviously I was telling the truth. The records also show that Gamrat exchanged dozens of texts and calls with Graham and Allard. The aides say that was nothing unusual. Joe Gamrat would call at all times inquiring about Cindy's whereabouts. What was unusual was what Gamrat did with that information. For instance, last February, Joe Gamrat followed his wife to the now infamous Radisson Hotel in downtown Lansing and called Allard to tell him what he discovered. And in that phone call, he says Cindy's husband, Joe, actually saw Cindy leaving one of these hotel rooms, Todd Courser's hotel room, early in the morning. He went back to his car. He called her. She picked up and said, well, why are you calling me? I've been sleeping for hours. And he said, oh, really? She said, yeah, I've been asleep. Like, why are you waking me up? This was just the tip of the iceberg. The police report revealed that even as Joe Gamrat was standing beside his wife in public, in private, he'd become obsessed with tracking her, spying on Cindy for months, and planting surveillance devices in her bag and car. Remember those photos of Courser giving Cindy a foot rub in a Lansing parking lot? Well, police found foot rub shots of the two on Joe Gamrat's iPhone. The level of the spying he was doing on his own wife was intense and amazing. I did not expect that. When that is happening to you, it's really traumatizing and there's, there's a, a fear component and um, when you, a feeling of not feeling safe or secure. And what does Joe Gamrat have to say about all of this? So we've tried reaching Joe Gamrat. We've texted him, we've called him, no response yet. So now we're gonna go to his house, see him in person to see if he has anything to say about this. Gamrat did come out to speak with us, but he wouldn't go on camera. He said he just wanted to put this whole thing behind him. Joe Gamrat is still the mystery man. If there's a cliffhanger in this story, it's Joe Gamrat. When we return, their political careers are over, and now maybe their marriages are too. It's hard. It's cold out. Why is Cindy Gamrat sleeping in a parking lot when 2020 returns? It is a bracing January evening. That's okay. It's politics. It'll take me a little while to kind of obviously heal from it and take some steps forward. Post-election, Corsa retreats back to his law office in Lapeer to lick his wounds. But there's some unfinished business fevering his brain. He just can't get over those mysterious text messages that hit his iPhone last May. Remember, a hidden extortionist threatened to reveal the affair unless he and Gamrat resigned. Harassment, which Corsa maintains, sent him over the edge. Do you believe at that point that you were being blackmailed? The texter was requiring me to resign. It felt like there was a bigger power at work here. Corser won't stop until he gets some answers. And that investigation will bring this story to its unlikely conclusion at this unexpected location with an even more surprising suspect. Was Corser up to his old tricks again? You wrote that email. Yeah. Why wouldn't you yeah. send those texts? The twists and turns lead to the mystery texter. I remember reading the report and, and just shaking and, and not wanting to believe. When 2020 returns. For months, it's been one of the biggest mysteries in Michigan politics. Who was the shadowy figure who sent those blackmail texts to Todd Corser and Cindy Gamera, threatening to expose them? I was looking to stab them in the back. In fact, the only relationship Corser and Gamrat seem to be cultivating is their own. The two are certainly close. I also think we're missing a component They go on here TV to together and even combine their two staffs, running operations out of the same office. Very unusual. So, I mean, as soon as they uh, got here, people were talking. There are also frequent late night sessions that have the two overnighting at the downtown Radisson Hotel. We actually would have lobbyists and fellow staff members ask us if they're having a relationship. But we also just couldn't believe that these two would do something like that. 
Todd's doing great. Yes, it is hard to believe. Todd Courser is married to his college sweetheart, Fawn. They have four kids together, pick apples in their spare time. That's a good one, buddy. And Cindy Gamrat is raising three kids of her own with her longtime husband, Joe. The kind of house mom you see smiling out of Facebook photos and price hunting in the produce aisle. Definitely, you don't forget the Oreos. <laughs> But the rumor mill keeps churning, and now somebody in this quiet capital is doing more than talking. It looks like they're stalking. Take a look at this. It's an uncredited photo of Courser giving Gamrat a foot rub in broad daylight while parked at a Lansing strip mall. The photo is posted online after a nameless paparazzo delivers it to controversial political blogger Brandon Hall. It was just like, wow. You know, I, I mean, I just want to thank my family. Gamrat takes her place in the pantheon of cheating politicians who issue public apologies with stoic spouses by their side. My husband is here, Joe, and I have three, three children. Joe Gamrat looks on, his face together. bereft of the family photo smile. What about your husband? Has he since forgiven you? He says he has, and I believe he has. I'm not here to resign today. I'm just here to say I'm sorry. How many people here feel that Cindy Gambrat should resign at this point in time? But sometimes sorry doesn't cut it. They need to resign immediately. Tad, you need to give it up. You need to come out now and, and say it's over. Just step down. With all the, the Christian values that are here, it must have rocked this community. It did. I mean, it, it really rocked our, our small town. Did they start saying you're not a real Christian? Yeah, oh, absolutely. A lot of times the most unforgiving people are people who profess Christ. So and you, I bet you've taken some hard questions from them. You know, some people really relish watching somebody burn. Just love it. And it's it's sick and it's evil and it's demonic. And remember, Gamrat and Courser already have plenty of enemies within their own party. Now the political knives are out. Their scandal was dragging everybody down. They were embarrassing the leaders. They were embarrassing the party. The House launches an investigation which finds numerous instances of deceptive, deceitful, and outright dishonest conduct by both representatives and says they abuse their... Just a week ago, Cindy Gamrat is formally announcing that she will run for her old seat. Yep, brazen as it may seem, Todd and Cindy have ended their affair, but now they want to continue their political careers. They were almost in denial. They didn't look at themselves the way everybody else in Michigan was looking at them. Why are you running again? One of the things that concerned me the most was that my voters didn't have a voice in the matter at all. Plenty of other candidates are vying for the seats too, but Gamrat and Courser have something the competition lacks. I have the highest name ID, I think, of anybody that's ever run for state house. I think what has happened is sort of um, elevated me to mythical status. But a lot of people will say, come on, name recognition, that's the reason you wouldn't be voted for. If you have time that passes, I uh, certainly have the best name recognition of anybody. But is um, it for the right reason? Well, it's negative now. But I said the people should have their opportunity to, to make their choice. But back in Lansing, their former colleagues aren't exactly eager to welcome them back. It was a continuation of the bizarre behavior. I think it showed contempt for the system. It showed their contempt for the voters. It'll be my name on the ballot. It's not about me. It's about the people. Courser and Gamrat say they are still the most conservative candidates running. Really now the, the voters will have an opportunity to be able to make their own decisions. This is no normal election. And now they just want to make laws, not love. Election day in West Michigan with several big seats. November 3rd. What do you think? Making up something so outrageous. <laughs> what? No one would believe it when the truth about his love life leaked out. Are you a hypocrite? We're right there with them as they speak to 2020 about the outrageous national scandal. Sex, lies, cover-ups. Cheating on their spouses. A lead story. A bizarre attempt to hide their extramarital affair. And a laughing stock. That is the worst plan I've ever heard. And I'm including trickle-down economics, the pull-out method, and the plot of the parent trap not about me. Tonight, blackmail. People were following you guys. It's as if they knew your every move. They did know every move. Threatening texts. Oh my God. A secret affair. Wow. All leading to disorder in the house. You have power, politics, sex. That's not how I wanted it to go. The circus needs to go. A capital offense. 
Good evening. I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And if you're stuck in a snowstorm tonight, settle in for tonight's mystery with plot twists you will not believe. The number one being, why would a politician fabricate an outrageous scandal to discredit himself? A scandal to cover up his real life secret. It all began a full year ago this month, but tonight the puzzle piece is finally coming together right here. Those recordings, the threats, and now the two at the center of... He intentionally leaked a fake news story about himself hiring a male prostitute. What? And it's irresistible to TV comments. Uh, well, I wasn't having an affair. I was actually hiring a male prostitute. <laughs> that is the worst plan I've ever heard. And I'm including trickle-down economics, the pull-out method, and the plot of the parent trap. Todd Corser always wanted to hit the big time, but not like that. Here you are on national TV, those comedy talk shows, you're the butt of jokes. Yeah. What's that like? I'm pretty tough, meaning um, I don't, my blood pressure doesn't go up a whole lot. But this was tough. One week later... I just want to thank my family. Gamrat takes her place in the pantheon of cheating politicians who issue public apologies with stoic spouses by their side. My husband is here, Joe, and I have three, three children. Joe Gamrat looks on, his face bereft of the family photo smile. What about your husband? Has he since forgiven you? He says he has, and I believe he has. I'm not here to resign today. I'm just here to say I'm sorry. How many people here feel that Cindy Gambrat should resign at this point in time? But sometimes sorry doesn't cut it. They need to resign immediately. Tad, you need to give it up. You need to come out now and, and say it's over. Just step down. With all the, the Christian values that are here, it must have rocked this community. It did. I mean, it, it really rocked our, our small town. But they start saying you're not... Makes his exit. Were you devastated? No. You know those lead blankets that they put on you at the dentist? It was like 20 of those came off me as I walked out the door. I got in my truck and drove away, and I got about, I think I got about five miles, and I just pulled into a, a parking lot, and I just turned the truck off, and uh, I didn't move for 12 hours. You've let down so many people, and God, if I could go back and undo it, you know, Lord knows I would. Back in the house chamber, it's four in the morning, and it's Cindy's turn to ascend the scaffold. She says she too thought about simply throwing in the towel. The other representative had resigned, and I panicked a little bit. But in that sea of hostility, Cindy finds a rock of support, her 18-year-old son, Joey. In my mind, resigning is kind of giving up the fight before you even get to actually fight. He said, stay and fight. He said, okay, mom, take a deep breath, and, uh, Hold your head high. You're going to walk in. You're going to act like you own the place. You know, I can't go back. I can't go back and change the past. The only thing I could do was try to go forward and do it better. And I still believe that my actions warrant, ex warrant censure, but not expulsion. Gamrat pleads her case a final time, but the house has heard enough. There are drove away. And I got about, I think I got about five miles, and I just pulled into a, a parking lot, and I just turned the truck off, and uh, I didn't move for 12 hours. You've let down so many people, and God, if I could go back and undo it, you know, Lord knows I would. Back in the house chamber, it's four in the morning, and it's Cindy's turn to ascend the scaffold. She says she too thought about simply throwing in the towel. The other representative had resigned, and I panicked a little bit. But in that sea of hostility, Cindy finds a rock of support, her 18-year-old son, Joey. In my mind, resigning is kind of giving up the fight before you even get to actually fight. He said, stay and fight. He said, okay, Mom, take a deep breath and uh, hold your head high. You're going to walk in. You're going to act like you own the place. You know, I can't go back. I can't go back and change the past. The only thing I could do was try to go forward and do it better. And I still believe that my actions warrant, ex warrant censure, but not expulsion. Gamrat pleads her case a final time, but the House has heard enough. There are 91 I votes and 12 nay votes. 
They vote 91 to 12 to expel her. She's escorted out with her head held high, making Michigan history as the first demand of Gamera. And adding teeth to the threat, the texter is referencing their private phone calls and inside details of their trips. It's as if they knew your every move. They did know every move. They knew my emails out of my outbox even after I changed my password. They knew texts from my phone. The texter is someone close, someone with the means and the will to destroy him. It's enough to put anyone on edge. There was just a, a lot of stress. Obviously, this was driving you to a breaking point. I would say that it, you couldn't have been at a lower spot. Todd is usually very chipper and, and sarcastic and fun, but there would be times where he would take things out on us with a great deal of anger. It was tough. Uh, it, was, it was very tough. And it's about to get a lot tougher as Representative Corser concocts a truly twisted plan to make his problems go away. He said, Ben, I need you to destroy me. And I, I paused for a second and I, I said, Todd, what do you mean? Stay with us. It is May in Michigan, and embattled state representative Todd Corser is alone in his law office in the small town of Lapeer, terrified that a mystery texter is on the verge of exposing his affair with colleague Cindy Gamrat. Now he makes the fateful decision to pick up the phone and call his right-hand man, Ben Graham. And the most serious is going to stick to the wall because it's so slimy. People will see it and they'll be like, holy <laughs> what is that? You know, I even hear my voice, I don't even recognize who I am. So when people find out that it came from you and it's about you, they're going to ask, are you crazy? Yeah, it's a, it, inside of that, at, the, at that moment, at that situation in the darkness of where I was at, just personally. Why did you decide to go with the storyline of a gay prostitute? I mean, did it was you so, think... It was so ridiculous. Um, it, it was really over the top. I know it was offensive to, to, you know, to homosexuals. It was completely ridiculous, and I didn't mean it. Let's listen to some of that audio. But what about Gamrat's role in the scheme? On the recording, Corser says she's down with the plan. Hey, we agreed. Who? Cindy and I. On this? Yeah. So, right there, he says that you both agreed on this. Mm hmm Yeah. Is he lying? Well, when I heard that audio, what ran through my mind is, why did he say that? So this email for you came out of left field? Yes. So that was is a lie? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Back in that law office, Corser's demented plan has little appeal for his aide, Ben Graham. Remember, Corser wants Graham to send the email for him. Instead, the trusted aide says he walks out of the meeting shaken and alarmed. I couldn't believe he was asking me, uh, and I, I, I couldn't do it. Story: A bizarre attempt to hide their extramarital affair and a laughing stock. That is the worst plan I've ever heard, and I'm including trickle-down economics, the pull-out method, and the plot of the parent trap. It's not about me. Tonight, blackmail. People were following you guys. It's as if they knew your every move. They did know every move. Threatening texts. Oh, my God. A secret affair. Wow. All leading to disorder in the house. You have power, politics, sex. That's not how I wanted it to go. The circus needs to go. A capital offense. Good evening, I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And if you're stuck in a snowstorm tonight, settle in for tonight's mystery with plot twists you will not believe. The number one being, why would a politician fabricate an outrageous scandal to discredit himself? A scandal to cover up his real life secret. It all began a full year ago this month, but tonight the puzzle piece is finally coming together right here. Those recordings, the threats, and now the two at the center of the affair speaking out to 2020 about why there was such an attempt to cover it up. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez with a capital offense. <laughs> Lansing, Michigan, its modest skyline nestled around the noble dome of the Capitol, is normally the humdrum hub of state government. Typical Midwest.